The wait is finally over. Seahawks rookies hit the field today for their first workouts. Veterans will join them a week from now. And I have a treat for you today. You may have heard him talk about baseball mostly, but Ty Dane Gonzalez, who hosts Locked On Mariners with Colby Patnode, also has a long history of writing and podcasting about the Seahawks. He and I haven't hooked up in a long time on this podcast, and so he's going to join me today, give me his thoughts on what he's looking for out of this rookie training camp, some specific names of guys he's intrigued by, his general thoughts on what he thinks of the Seahawks team as they get ready to actually start the season. No more waiting. Let's get into it. This is Seahawks Forever. Welcome to the Seahawks Forever podcast. In-depth analysis on everything Seahawks. And now, here's your host, Dan Viennes. It's go time, you guys. Training camp is finally here. Seems like the longest offseason ever, doesn't it? But now we get to actually talk about what happens on the field and start looking ahead to the first game at home against the Denver Broncos. Two months from now, six, seven, eight weeks, whatever. Math, it's too early in the morning for looking at a calendar. Sorry. Hey, as we move towards the season, if you like what's happening here and you want to support the channel, all the different ways you can do that are down below in the description. But namely, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit that bell button for notification of future episodes. If you prefer audio podcasts, you can listen on whichever platform you prefer. You can hear ad-free episodes on Spotify for a low monthly fee. I'll put that down below as well as you can support me through buy me a coffee or through a super thanks. Or you can also just sign up for YouTube Premium, which allows you to watch ad-free content all throughout YouTube. And also, uh, some of that does come back to the channel. So that's another way to support me as well. Lots of cool stuff planned for the next couple of weeks. But I'm really excited to get together today with Ty. It has been, uh, we were talking about this before we went on air today. Uh, it's been a couple of years since we actually talked Seahawks on a podcast. We used to do that more regularly. And then uh, back when I did uh, other podcasts, we would talk about the Mariners as well. So I want to tease that a little bit. Some bonus content to stick around for if you're also a Mariners fan. Stick around till the end because with the trade deadline looming and the Seahawks holding on to a precarious, I mean the Mariners holding on to a precarious one game lead in the AL West. Heading into the opening of the second half, their home series against the Houston Astros, who are right on their tails. We had to talk some Mariners as well. But first, it's Ty and me talking Seahawks. Here we go. Joining me on the show for the first time, we were just discussing before I hit record in literally years, Ty Dane Gonzalez, who you usually probably listen to talk about Mariners uh, content on Locked On Mariners, but also produces and works with Maddie and Griff over at Seattle Overload. You might have read his stuff formerly on All Seahawks, working with Corbin Smith also back in the day. Ty, it's good to have you on. We're going to talk some football today for a change. Yeah, it's uh, really nice to talk football for for once. Uh, you know, I've been kind of just producing behind the scenes for Maddie and Griff over on Overload for for the last few months. Like, I haven't really been on the show in a while, basically since the the season ended. I think the last show that I was on, like actually physically on, was the the Pete Carroll firing reaction, or maybe it was the Mike McDonald hire reaction, which seems like a million and, years ago, right? Right. So, yeah, so it's been a while. So it's been really nice. Like I was telling you right before we hit record on this thing, like for me, it's just been Mariners, Mariners, Mariners. It's been trade deadline, trade deadline, trade deadline, draft for a couple of days and then trade deadline. And that's just kind of where my mind's been at. But I've been so into this college football game that, that came out a couple of days ago. Mm, Training yeah. camp's almost here. So I'm starting to get back into like football mode right now. Everyone's excited about college football 25. I'm kind of glad I never got into that. I tried. I tried to play Madden years ago over and over again. Yeah. I, I suck at it. I'm terrible. I'm a I'm a child of the Atari era, and I could never move past a single joystick and a button. I just couldn't do it. And so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of glad, I guess, at this age because I, there's other things that I could be spending my time <laughs> doing. Uh, thumbs up so far, though, on the game? Yeah, no, it's, it's great. I mean... Like I, I hear people that are like, oh, it's not it's not like Madden. It's not like it's it's kind of like Madden. <laughs> there's still a lot of Madden stuff in it, which, you know, there's there's some jank that comes with that. But overall, I'm having a great time with it. I, I think they've really done a good job with the presentation of it all. And uh, I mean, it's just it's nice to have a college football game again. 
and who's your, uh, you know, who's your team? Who's your go-to team you're playing with right now? So I don't really have a team in college football in general. Uh, so I've just been kind of winging it. I mean, like I like West Virginia from like the Geno and Tavon Austin days. So I've played a little West Virginia. Uh, obviously SC because of Pete. Uh, I've played some SC. Um, I, I do, and you'll, you'll like this. I do want to do a, uh, a Wazoo, uh, dynasty and find them a new That's home cool. or rebuild the PAC 12 potentially. Cause the PAC 12 is still in the game. So right. uh, it's just, you yeah. know, it's, it's, it's Oregon state and, w- and Wazoo right now. Um, so I, so I might, I might rebuild the PAC 12. We'll see. Uh, let me ask you this too, producing Seattle overload, how much smarter have you gotten about the X's and O's of the games just listening to those two guys? Yeah, it's it's certainly helped my football knowledge a lot. Sometimes I get lost in it though. <laughs> you know, right. some sometimes they'll just go on and on and on and which is great. Like don't get me wrong, like it's so much good information, but I'll just be like what? <laughs> Yeah. So, yep. but it's, 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 it's helped a lot. It's helped a lot. Maddie and Griff, they're, they're two of the best of the biz. I like some of the perspective they have. I mean, there's, there's been times that, you know, they've changed my mind about a player. Um, mm-hmm. But I also appreciate that they're open to having their minds changed. You know, I, I, yeah. I've heard, you know, Griff's kind of come around on the Tyrese Knight pick. And that's kind of where I want to start. The Seahawks mm-hmm. open training camp today. Rookies reported yesterday. I think they hit the field today in earnest and then a week from today the veterans will join them um as you look at this draft class now and you've had a couple months to digest it and you've heard all the reports of you know through mini camp and and uh and the mandatory mini camp with the whole roster being on hand if you were on the field today if you got access to vmac today and you got to watch their first workouts who where would you where would your eyes go who are some of the draft picks first of all that you're most excited to see yeah, in terms of like who I would want to see on uh, at camp specifically, I mean, you're not going to learn a lot about like the offensive linemen in, in camp work. So like Christian Haynes out, Byron Murphy probably also out in that regard. Um, I kind of want to see DJ James. I'm I'm very intrigued by him as as a potential nickel option uh, this year. So seeing him go up in one on ones against some of the receivers, obviously stellar receiving core uh, the Seahawks have. So that's going to be a great test for those guys, for those young guys uh, to have every single day in camp. Uh, once the veterans start to to get into the fold, um, so James Pritchett, uh, AJ Barner a uh, little bit as well. I'm I'm pretty intrigued by him. Uh, but it's really like those three guys, you know, it's the, it's the skill players, right. Uh, in camp that, that I really want to look at. And then once we get into actual game action, then Christian Haynes, then, uh, Byron Murphy for sure. I'm kind of the same way. I'm, I, I was fascinated by the process when it happened of taking those two corners, Pritchett and James, when none of us really were expecting that they would. And then it kind of ended up being one of my favorite aspects of the draft to load up to take advantage of value in the draft and load up on a position that you thought was already strong and kind of layer Mm. that, set yourself up even better for the future. I can't wait to see how that competition is going to play out. Uh, I've got a couple favorite undrafted guys that I'm going to be keeping, keeping an eye on. Uh, Do you have a couple? Yeah. I mean, linebacker is such a huge question mark right now, especially with the health of Dodson and Baker. And then, you know, we'll see on night, obviously, you know, Griff and some of the tape guys haven't been too fond of him. I know they've kind of warmed up to him as of late, but in general, there's still a lot of question marks there. I I know the Seahawks really, really like him, but off ball linebacker to me is a massive question mark on this roster. So Easton Gibbs, maybe as a, as a potential back end uh, or someone that can make the roster on the back end of that position group. Uh, Cause there isn't a ton of depth there, you know? So uh, Gibbs is someone that also got a nice chunk of change uh, in the undrafted process as well. I think he made like $40,000 uh, guaranteed, something like that. So uh, they, they seem to, to like him. Uh, Jack Westover is, is someone that I'm, I'm fascinated by because He's like the one guy that knows this offense or at least knows Ryan Grubb. Obviously, the offense is going to be a bit different as he, you know, adapts his his style to the NFL. But um, I I feel like that probably earns him some goodwill. And, you know, stylistically, with the way this offense is probably going to go with the direction this offense is probably going to go like they could add four tight ends for sure. Uh, So maybe he's that fourth tight end. Yeah, especially there's there's some intrigue with Westover in regards to maybe being able to play 
a little bit of fullback, H back yeah. kind of stuff and, and what Grub mm-hmm. can do with him there. Yeah, he's fun. Gibbs is interesting to me, the kid out of Wyoming. He's uh Michael Thompson, who I've had on the show a number of times, writes for 12th Man Rising. He told me about Gibbs in November last year, I think. He's mm-hmm. like, Hey, I found this kid from Wyoming, this this rugged linebacker you gotta you gotta check out. Uh and so I knew the name immediately. Uh I've I've have an affinity for Hayden Hatton. Uh I, I just I got to meet the kid. He's he's terrific, but just his film is great. And my only thing with him, like he looks like a guy that in almost every other year would have a shot to make the team as a fifth or sixth receiver. And and probably, you know, he's one of those do anything for the team kind of guys. He, he contributed on special teams as well. He just looks like an NFL receiver to me. Uh, testing scores, you know, speed be damned. Mm. It It's just, I wonder because we, you know, we put one of those guys on the roster last year and Jake Bobo. He's a little bit bigger, but stylistically they're similar. I just don't know if that's a little redundant, unfortunately, because mm-hmm. I think he's a guy that you try to get him through to the practice squad and someone someone who might need help at receiver right. might snag him. But as far as the preseason goes, he's one of the guys and I'm excited to see him play. And then you, uh, you mentioned that we can't really tell much about the offensive linemen. Uh, I thought Garrett Greenfield not getting drafted was a shock. I thought he was a steal and undrafted free agency or one of the better signings out there. Yeah. Um, I I think he's he intrigued me from the combine on. Didn't really know who he was before then. I, you know, Michael Gerald has some interesting upside. They drafted in the sixth round. I think it's going to be interesting. He Greenfield might be one of those guys when they when the bullets start flying that that they might just, he might force his way, he might force them to have to figure out a way to protect him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know, like, uh, they would prefer he be on the on the practice squad, but, yeah, I, I, you know, teams need offensive line talent. Yeah. So, yeah, they might have to try and protect him. You know, just use that 53-man roster spot on him just to, to keep him off of the, off of, uh, off of waivers so um yeah and then i would add on the on the receiver note i mean they just have so many guys in that position group behind the the big four essentially of you know metcalf lockett uh jsn and bobo chenault d eskridge how many of those kind of style uh, like how much of that style do they want because of like the yeah. new kickoff rules all that like D Williams is another guy speaking of undrafted guys. Like, does mm-hmm. he factor into that equation? Um, so that's going to be really interesting to see how kind of the, the back end of the receiving group works out. Do they keep five? Do they keep six? Cause that also impacts again, like we talked about with Westover that impacts how many tight ends you're going to be able to carry all that. So um, receivers is it's always, it's, it's by far my favorite um, position group to, to cover during this time of year because Receivers in general are just so fun. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But and you and you touched on it this year more than ever. That that new kickoff rule is going to change the way some yeah. teams construct their roster. I mean, they might yeah. carry a sixth or seventh receiver yeah. in some cases. Yeah, they've done seven uh, once, but also you know we kind of have to throw out this like they've done this and they've done that because right. it's a new coaching staff now, so we don't know what they're going to do. We don't know how they prefer to, you know, stack up one position group compared to the other. So we're going to have to learn. We're going to have to learn new trends, all that. You know, it's been a long, long time since we've had to do this. So It's interesting. I actually have a guest coming on Saturday who uh, wrote a piece where he went, he went over all 400 plus kickoff returns in the, in the XFL with this Mm -hmm. new rule and uh, broke it down and how teams are using it. Uh, It'll be interesting to get his take on it. I was just listening to, um, Bucky Brooks and Daniel Jeremiah on their Move the Sticks podcast a couple of days ago. And DJ said that he's had coaches tell him, some coaches in the league, in fact, he estimated it as about maybe 30% that have just said, we're just going to kick it out of the end zone, let him take it on the 30. Like, we don't want to yeah. mess with it. It certainly seems like, though, based on some of the personnel they've brought in, the Seahawks intend to try to go for it and and make something out of that and make it an yeah, opportunity. Quite, quite a few teams have. Uh, I just again, I don't, I don't really know how much of an impact it's ultimately going to have because, like you just said, uh, I feel like a lot of teams are just going to go. Eh, we'll just give you the ball at the twenty-five. There's just too much risk involved in this. 
and I don't feel like we're going to get answers in the preseason. Do you? Like, I don't think I think teams are going to play. No, close to the I think best. they're not going to unveil their best kickoff plays in the preseason. Yeah, yeah, and I think like teams are are just going to test it out, test out their kick coverage. So we'll see yeah. returns. But I yeah, I just really I, vanilla. I, yeah, I just I think overall though, teams are going to look at it as like, is this really worth the risk for a few yards? Yeah. You know, because it seems like it's with the 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 blocking schemes and all that, like it can go sideways pretty quickly for for the for the kicking team. So, yeah, I think at that point you just kind of go, eh, we'll just give them the you know, we'll we'll deal with having them start at the twenty five instead of the twenty, right? Yeah. Right. You mentioned the coaching staff. We've had six months now of sample size and data points just kind of watching them go about their business uh where do you stand today on on how you feel about that staff i'm still in wait and see mode because you know the the last few months it's just it's buzzwords and it's all that type of stuff like we always see um but you know my first impressions overall it's very different right it's a very different group from any group Pete Carroll has brought in, and obviously Mike Mc, Mike McDonald is very different from Pete Carroll in general. That's very very obvious. It's very apparent. Mike McDonald's more of the you know he's just kind of the stereotypical coach, right? Uh, I think Tyler Lockett. I, I was listening to him on on Rich Eisen's show. I don't know a month or so ago, and he kind of equated Mike McDonald's style to like the military, right? Which is that's the complete opposite of Pete Carroll, right? right. So. Um, yeah, I think overall, though, in terms of like how uh, that style is going to be applied and what the defense is going to look like, you know, again, we've, we've heard a lot of buzzwords. Like I, I was listening to Boye Mafe on Chris Long's podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago, and mm-hmm. he was talking about like, you know, we're going to we're going to be multiple. We're going to disguise, you know, what we're doing and all that. And it's like, OK, that, that's great. You know, that sounds fun. But like, what does that actually look like? And are you guys actually going to be able to execute that and fulfill that vision that that mcdonald has so i'm really fascinated to see you know again just once we get into games what does this ultimately look like and then from an offensive standpoint how does ryan grubb adapt to the nfl how much does his offense differ from what he was doing at uw because he has all the talent in the world on this offense how is he going to be able to use that talent and is he going to be able to get the most out of you know gino and this receiving core, which is, this is most likely going to be the last season with this specific receiving core all intact. Uh, so, and then, you know, obviously the running game, like they, they want to run the ball. Every team does, but they won't really want to run the ball. Uh, are they going to be able to get that run game going and, and have it be consistent? And how long is it going to take that offense to ultimately gel together? And how long is it going to take for, for grub to really find his groove as well as a play caller? It's interesting. You touch on maybe the two aspects I'm most fascinated to watch. And and again, probably really won't see it until the, the regular season starts. But one is, you know, all the the things that we've seen him do in that scheme at both Michigan and Baltimore that excite us so much because they're so different than the way Pete Carroll conducted defense where, you know, we heard the word vanilla a lot and a lot of base defense and not trying to trick you or deceive you in any way, just trying to be assignment sound and play you straight up. Well, the Mm -hmm. issue the last couple of years is those assignments weren't followed the way they were supposed to be. So we've kind of gotten numb or maybe a little desensitized over the last couple of off seasons with Carroll hearing about new scheme changes and a different approach to defense. And yet the results on the field were not great. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, I'll believe it when I see it. There's no reason to think we're not going to see it. It's just, that's the thing I most want to see. Yeah. What what is it ultimately going to look like though? Right. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. exactly. And then on offense, I think it's, it's not getting lost in the conversation and enough people over the off season have talked about it. But the fact that Carroll was known so much for running the football, even after he started to evolve, and that offense, especially the last couple of years under Russ, became much more pass-heavy, especially on early downs, I think there's this assumption because of what Grubb did at UW that it's going to be this high-flying offense with the running game supplementing it, even though they continue to talk about how they want to be a physical running game. He has history as an Mm -hmm. offensive line coach and as earlier in his college career where they ran the ball very physically, very effectively. And even at times at UW, there were times that that they needed to. I remember the USC game when Dylan Johnson went crazy. 
um, that I'm interested to see is, is how does that look? Uh, you know, what, what kind of ultimately what blocking scheme do they end up leaning on? And then can they get the most out of those running backs? Because yep. it's a great young running back room. And it's one that in all these off season lists of like best position groups and best young players under 25, I feel like it's being underrated. Yeah. 100%. I, and this is going to be a, a huge year for, for a lot of these veterans that have been carried over from the Carroll era to the, the McDonald era, specifically Gino. Right. And, and mm-hmm. I think, you know, I, I'm a I'm a Gino believer, right? A Gino truther, if you will. I, I think Gino at his peak is a top ten quarterback in the NFL. Uh, I think he can make all the throws. I think he's he has some of the most impressive tape of any quarterback in the NFL right now. Um, and you know, if you don't want to believe me or trust me on that, just look at the people that get paid a lot of money to do this stuff for a living. Like they love Gino. Yeah. Uh, Gino is. I think more than capable of being a quarterback for a Super Bowl team. And I I think he can even work his way. I mean, as he did, you know, for a little while there in 2022, work his way into fringe MVP talk. So I want to see Brian Grubb be able to tap into that, right? Try and get the most out of Geno. Well, also, yeah, you have a solid offensive line. You have a really good running back in Kenneth Walker and also Zach Charbonnet. Like you want to try and get the most out of those guys as well. But again, you have DK Metcalf, you have Jackson Smith and Jigba, you have Tyler Lockett. Use that to your advantage. Take advantage of that while you have that. Because again, this is probably the last year you're going to have those three guys all together. Right. And add Noah Fant to the mix. I think there's finally Noah a commi- as well. commitment yeah. there with the two-year deal bringing him back at the money they did to maybe, you know, try to feature him more as a receiver, certainly give him a higher snap count. Um, yeah. And, and I, I, I keep trying to steer <laughs> Gino debate when I get it from doubters back to what I think is going to be the biggest difference. Everyone talks about the offensive line. Oh, if they can just protect him, I think he can be really effective. Mm-hmm. He was really effective the last seven games of last year with a really yep. bad offensive line. And, 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 and the Pittsburgh game stands out in particular. And just a couple of weeks ago, Mina Kimes and Dan Orlovsky were going back and forth and showing tape from that game. And and it yep. really showed off his pocket awareness, his pocket movement. Now he's able to m- manipulate in the pocket and get throws off downfield. To me, it's and not the tight much, window throws are yeah. ridiculous. And yeah. it, and does anyone really does he have the best stroke in the NFL? Yeah. I mean, yeah. when you watch the the videos that his his uh, personal quarterback coach Quincy Avery's been putting out, or he's you know, it's, I don't think it's drone footage, but he's got it up on a stick and it's kind of from behind and sort of bird's eye view. And he's wearing the helmet, and the shoulder pads, like he, my, my NBA comp that comes to mind is he, he reminds me of Ray Allen and the stroke he had, yeah. how easy he makes it look like if you're, I'll, I'll give I'll give you a, I'll give you a baseball comp. I'll give you a Mariners comp. Actually. It's like Brian Wu. It's his delivery. It's just so effortless, yeah. right? It's just so the there is no wasted motion, yeah. right? And then the ball just explodes out of his hand. Yeah. And I think what's going to get the most out of him isn't necessarily the offensive line, which I'm bullish on. I think they've added more significant young talent across that line in the last 12 months than than they have in a long time. And and I I think they're going to be deep. It's improving the defense. It's, you know, they were 30th in the league last year, number of plays run and 32nd in drives. Like yeah. More opportunities. I, I, I think mm-hmm. when you look at his stats overall last year and just say, well, the numbers were down from the year before, even if you prorate for the games he missed to injury, it's he, he wasn't on the field. He didn't get opportunities. If that defense just becomes manageable, yeah. league average, he's going to mm-hmm. get more opportunities. And Ryan Grubb, I hope, is going to take advantage of that. Right. Well, and also you mentioned the injury, right? Uh, ever since what happened in New York happened, right? He clearly wasn't the same guy for a while there and then we started to see more you know like Gino, like tennessee pittsburgh etc mm-hmm. but i think for the you know for most of the year Gino wasn't you know no one's ever a hundred percent especially in the nfl but i think Gino was certainly not even close to his hundredth percentile for for most of 2023 so if we could stay healthy as well i think that's a huge part of this and um Again, like we we saw kind of the proof of concept in 2022 when it comes to Gino, like over the course of a full season. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that that New Orleans game still like still one of the more impressive performances I've seen from a from a Seahawks quarterback in quite some time. Yeah, 
That was the one with the the two deep throws to lock it, right? The two deep throws, yes. the one where he rolled out to his to his left and and found Fant on the oh, sideline. Yeah. That yeah. yeah, yeah, he was he was popping off that game. <laughs> God, you talk about the beating they take. Have you have you had a chance yet to watch the receiver series on Netflix? I uh, haven't watched that. No, not yeah. yet. You watched quarterback last year though, right? Yeah, I I saw the Devonte Adams clip. Uh, that it's, kind of went viral from the what was it the Lions game where he was he was upset with Jimmy G. A little bit saw that yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's it's it I think it's the most fascinating storyline of those two of those two series I'm three episodes in on receiver and it's all about the beating these guys take like it's mm, it's remarkable yeah. it's and it you know now there's more access than ever in the league we're seeing the off-season hard knocks now with the giants which yeah is fascinating the access amazing stadium. by the way i i love that i wish we would have that in all sports especially like again just quickly bringing it back to the mirrors with how, like how much stuff the mirrors front office does like if we yeah. could ever get behind the scenes footage of that like i would love that i that's my one of my favorite aspects of sports in general is is front office stuff you know trades free agency discussions all that stuff like seeing how that actually works being able to get a glimpse of that i think is great i would like to see like an actual good front office in well, the spotlight on one of those I think, though <laughs> i think there's a question in there somewhere like it's you know pete carroll and john schneider were always very outspoken about how they didn't want to do it and even in, mm. before they changed the rules that protected good teams basically from having to to be in the mix for that they i think there were some times that reportedly they were offered and they said no they just didn't want to give that kind of access like now i don't i don't know if we'll see it with the new staff i don't know if it's a new mindset or if that's predominantly a schneider thing uh they're not even allowing pictures or video at practice this year which yeah. i guess from a strategic standpoint is understandable but frustrating last year I, I went and took a bunch of video at the mock game did a couple shows you know got some really cool mileage out of it and people really really liked that appreciated it and i didn't mm. have to worry about copyright uh strikes um <laughs> but i mean as a fan don't you want to see that like the seahawks have tried to do it now they dip their toe in they do the yeah. series on youtube but it's really a mm. whole lot of nothing it's really a lot of cliche yeah. stuff and not in depth like or are the giants going too far like they got some intimate behind the scenes like the, the saquon like, yeah, the I'm saquon stuff is pretty damning yeah. yeah yeah so yeah again that's what i'm saying it's like be nice to to have this be behind the scenes with like an actual competent <laughs> front office right yeah. um but I'd it also is yeah it also is fascinating to see a front office that's like that though and actually see what you know how, how those things end up you know coming to fruition there um and i get yeah. why they might not want to show some of the negotiation stuff, you know, and, and I mean, give away for, some for, stylistic stuff. But but I want to see what I want to see is the teaching. You know, we hear so much about yeah. Mike McDonald's teaching style and how he's able to communicate these concepts and break them down into such a simple way that that it's easy for players to digest. So they can just react and everyone's on yeah. the same page and they know on any given snap, you know, where the pressure is going to come from. I want to see that teaching style. I want to see Ryan Grubb and Scott Huff teach because I've heard that's what they're so good at. You know, I, yeah. I get not wanting to do the Monty Austin Fort thing where you're showing these long phone conversations. Where you're, sure. kind of giving a, you're giving away some technique, right? I mean, I mean, also like, look, if, if you want to show that stuff, record it and then drop it like 10 years from then. Right. <laughs> right. Right, like let's at that get point, the Jimmy Graham trade conversations. Right. Yeah. Now. Exactly. Yeah. Let's let's get that now. Right. Let's, let's get Percy Harvin. Yeah, now. Percy Harvin, all that stuff. Yeah. Let's let's get that now. Right. Like, but not Jamal. Uh, it's too soon. Too soon. That that too soon. The Russ discussions, obviously, very you know, still still oh, way too, too soon on that. But yeah, I mean, I would that would be the ideal. Right. Is to get that. You know, the, I think the thing we've all kind of waited for and hoped for is that we'll get a 30 for 30 eventually, like where Pete actually opens up and talks about these things. I, I uh, think that's that's got to be a no, <clears throat> excuse me, a no brainer. It's got to be on the top of ESPN's whiteboard, you know, in future projects yeah. is that whole Legion of Boom, Super Bowl 49, how that kind of undermined a lot of the, the chemistry. And it has to be done. If not a 30 for 30, then a full blown documentary series at some point. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a story that I don't think has been told yet. And uh, no, 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 no. Like we, at least, at least from the, like 
hearing it from them specifically, mm-hmm. right? Like, I think we have a general idea from all the all the stories that have come out, the reports, et cetera. I think we can, like, piece together most of it. But I want to hear it from them directly. I want to hear it from Pete specifically. Yeah. And I think now that Pete's starting to to make his transition into, you know, the 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 next chapter of his life, and maybe we'll see if he if he wants to get back into coaching. I have doubts about him actually being able to do that, even if he wants to. Um, but once he like once he's f- far enough removed from coaching from his time with the Seahawks. I I hope that he is willing to to open up about things and really tell us what was going on, especially here in the in the latter years of his tenure in Seattle. Even at some point just how this year went down. Like he's been remarkably yeah. quiet. And, and yeah. you know, granted he's been coaching for 40 straight years, you know, he's he's yeah. spending some well-deserved time with his wife and family, I'm sure, but are you, are you a little surprised we haven't heard anything from him yet? Or do you think it's it's simply because he's still under contract with the team and we might have to wait 10 more months? I, this doesn't surprise me. Again, like you said, like he's spending time with, time with Glenna and his family and like he's just kind of doing that and he's making his transition. And Pete's such an ultra competitive dude that it's he's probably going through it right now still yeah. right even though that it's been months like he's probably especially now that it's training camp time and who loves practice more than pete carroll right like this is probably killing him that he's not able to be there at the field doing this thing like i'm sure he's glad and grateful that he's not having to spend the countless hours that it takes you know night in night out especially during the the dead period of the season or of the off season right and like doing the draft and all that i'm sure he's grateful for that but now that we're at this part i think this is the big test for him and his transition is not being not doing anything during training camp time not doing anything during preseason and then once we actually get into real games and he's just there sitting on the couch watching you know the seahawks play just anyone play on sundays i think that's probably it's gonna sing for him uh, you know, quite a bit and and it's going to take him some time to get used to. And, you know, I think, I think eventually kind of once he works through that, then he'll be willing to talk more and make more appearances and stuff like that. What I'm really fascinated to see is how do the Se- Seahawks handle his legacy and how quickly do they handle his legacy? Cause you know, we can talk about whether it was time or not, all that stuff still for such a prominent figure in the organization, you know, it ended pretty unceremoniously. Right. Yeah. And like, I mean, Pete Carroll is the Seahawks, right? Like that's like the identity is Pete Carroll, whether or not he's the coach. Right. And like, I love Pete, you know, I got my signed Pete Carroll picture back there. Right. I got win forever somewhere here in the background as well. Like love Pete. Right. And like for me personally, I want to see them honor him as soon as possible. I would, I want a statue. I want him raising yeah. the 12th man flag on, on week one, frankly, against the Broncos. Uh, you know, I want them to celebrate him and I want them to do it, you know, and I don't want to get too morbid with this, but I want to do it. I want them to do it sooner rather than later. Right. Where he's right. still, where he's still him, where he's yeah. still around and he's still him. Right. That's great perspective. I, I hadn't really considered how much this week, is probably hitting him and the 12th man flag as you as you're giving that answer uh i was thinking about it and right before you said uh he should raise the 12th man flag at denver i'm thinking well you couldn't do that game like it's literally mike mcdonald's debut right you don't want to overshadow him and and maybe because he is still under contract and you know analyst quote unquote maybe Maybe after a season goes, maybe the opening game, home game next year. But but that yeah. 12th man thing, it, the flag thing has to happen at some point, you know. Or maybe I, it's I the first primetime game. The we, we know how much he loves. know that there's no bad blood and that we yeah. revere this guy, the better. Yeah. I, I think the first primetime game, maybe. Uh, when is that? Is that the Thursday night game against the, against the 49ers? Is that the first primetime game in Seattle? So. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe do that. We know how much he loved primetime games in Seattle. Yeah. So, yeah. October yeah, there 10th. it is. Yeah. 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 October 10th. So, um, what do you make of the schedule, by the way? I think they really need to win those first two games. 
Mm-hmm. I think that's pretty critical. Um, I think Miami is also a winnable game, but that relies upon the defense, right? How improved is this defense and how much have they come together within a, a few weeks time? Cause obviously that's a very dynamic offense, even though I don't <laughs> think Tua is good, <laughs> but they, they make things happen, right? And they're able to run the ball quite a bit. Uh, and they have a ton of speed, obviously with Tyreek and uh, yeah. HN and all those guys. So, God, what's That's even more be fascinating. fascinating about that Miami matchup is, you know, their defense needs to take a step forward. They lost, you know, Christian Wilkins. Yeah. They lost some yeah. some players off that defense. They bring in Denard Wilson from the Raven staff. They're they're going to install the exact same scheme. Yeah. It's uh, yeah, J- Jordan Brooks, the whole thing against Jordan yeah. Baker. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. a an a non conference game between two teams that have very little history against each other, except you know, first playoff win many many years ago like there's there's incredible intrigue in that game yeah and then finally we get a lions game in prime time those games have been so good yeah between these two teams they finally figured so, it out yeah so they, they finally figured it out that's gonna that's gonna be an electric game i i suspect it's gonna be another high scoring game gino and Goff just going you know pound for pound in that one um it's, it's a the fun new schedule. version it's the new edition of Seattle and Carolina, although a much more high scoring edition where it doesn't matter what the formula is for figuring out your schedule every year, where you finish in your division or what we just get the lines on the road. Yeah. 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 It's like, uh, it's like how they went to soldier field. I, I swear like four or five times in a row. And like, I think from like 2009 to 2012 or something like that, it was just always soldier field. And then they went to soldier field in the playoffs a couple of times. Like, Enough with Soldier Field. Bring the Bears to Seattle. Like, come on. <laughs> like, right. yeah. it has to be time. Like, you know, because there's obviously like a, a formula to it. Like, we know what the formula is, but sometimes it just feels like with the Lions, with the Bears back in the day, it just feels like, oh no, they're just breaking the formula. It's just we're always going to Chicago for some reason. What are your expectations? How good do you think this team can be in year one? Well, I'll say this with the way that we've heard John Schneider talk about the Mike McDonald hire and just making the decision to move on from Pete, put in a new staff. It's in a, it's in an effort to elevate this current roster, not to rebuild, but to elevate what they already had to take them to that next uh, level. So to me, I, I think, you know, 10 wins, 11 wins, like that should be the expectation because they've won nine games twice now. They made it to the playoffs in 2022. Like the next step essentially is get back into the playoffs, perhaps compete for the division, win 10 or 11 games. I I, I think, and I think that's fair again with everything that they have publicly said, right? When it comes to making these changes, uh, so I, I know that's a lot to put on a first time head coach and, and, a you know, first time coaching staff, but again, that's just kind of what has been sold to us. At least that's how I've taken it. That's where I've settled. I, I was very cautious, you know, the first few months and said often on this show that I didn't really care about wins and losses this year, as long as I saw, you know, products on the field that I thought could you know evolve into a contender by 2025 that if we felt good at the end of the year essentially you know kind of like we did at the end of 2012 2012 2011 that that that's all that mattered but but my optimism has grown and 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 i basically landed just where you did that this team won nine games the last two years with a flawed roster a flawed approach and poor execution and i believe this offseason added more talent to that base and, it, and mm-hmm. it's young talent, and it's pretty well distributed throughout the roster that there really aren't any glaring weak spots. There's questions about inside linebacker, and there will continue to be questions about offensive line until until we see the five that are out there. But mm-hmm. that you basically brought in a coaching staff that is that is universally revered for their ability to teach and uh, and get the most out of players, and you've added talent to the roster, in my opinion. And so, you know, I think it looks like a ten or eleven win team. I'm with you. It's and maybe that's yeah. my Seahawks action green colored glasses that I'm that I'm looking through. But 
that's what I expect. I mean, it's well, uh, it's not an easy division, right? Like, yeah. they, how do you feel about where the Rams and 49ers are? Is is Can you win 11 games having to deal with those guys, you know, four times out of the year? I mean, Aaron Donald's gone. That's a good start. That's not <laughs> and then, uh, you know, the 49ers are weaker, I would say. And we'll see what happens with the IU situation. Obviously, that would make them uh, weaker, at least in, in the short term, if they trade him. Yeah. Um, so... I don't know if the I don't know if the ne- division is necessarily gettable. 49ers are still really good even with some of the losses that they've had and even if they do trade IU it's still a really good team that is very well coached. Um at least in terms of the regular season, right? We can talk about the playoffs and Shanahan and all that stuff. But right. Regular season wise like they're they're a very very tough out. Um and again we we don't know how things are going to gel on both sides of the ball with with the new coaching staff uh but like we've talked about here for the last you know 30 or so minutes like there's a lot of talent all across this roster this offense very talented and and if this offense can reach its 100th percentile at least a handful of times over the course of the season or even its 90th percentile like they should be able to win quite a few games so on that alone yeah, what I'm curious about and interested in seeing is just a different approach when they get up on a team early. You yeah. know, during the Carroll mm-hmm. years, we saw a lack of ability or maybe even willingness to put their foot on the gas pedal and put teams away and let yeah. teams hang around. And that, that you know, Carroll used to wear that as a badge of honor. You know, can't win the game in the first, second, third quarter, whatever. We're going to hang around and, and just, you know, play close to the vest sometimes, sometimes to a fault, I think. I, I don't suspect that'll be the case with this staff. And if no. we get a team where it's just, we, you know, the game plan's right or there's a mismatch early on, that they'll be able to exploit that. I'd like to see some easy wins along the way for a change. Yeah, that would be nice. That would be nice. A couple yeah. blowouts would be great. Yeah. Make Good my time. Sundays a little easier. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I, already, I already get enough excitement with all the all the one-run games the Maris play in. So. <laughs> yeah. It, it makes it easier to do a, a, a game recap show if you yeah. know the outcome. Yeah. But third yeah. Quarter. Yeah, yeah. Hundred <laughs> percent. Um, appreciate all your insight there on the Seahawks, but I want to offer uh, some bonus content here to our Seahawk fans who are also Mariner fans. I know you have been knee deep in this this entire season. It has kind of taken taken the city by storm. Uh, the Mariners get off to a great start. Six weeks ago, they have a ten game lead in the division. It's down to two within three weeks. Now it sits at one as we come out of the All Star break. All the talk is yeah. about the trade deadline, but it's we're stuck right now. I've been having a bunch of debates on Twitter the last couple of days with people that are just, you know, hammering the, the organization for not making deals now to supplement the lineup. But is this did I read this stat correctly? 28 of the 30 teams in baseball are within three games of a playoff spot, something like that, that there just isn't any movement because teams don't know where they land. What give me. Give me, I guess, on a scale of one. What, what are the odds? that two weeks from now when the trade deadline comes and goes, that we're going to see significant upgrades made to the Mariners offense because you can hear the cynics, you hear the naysayers out there. It's all talk. They're not going to make the big moves. They're going to tweak here and there, and it's going to be same old, same old. Uh, The odds should be relatively high. I'll say that should be in the the key word there, right? Uh, It's doing a lot of work in that sentence. But we'll see. You know, like you mentioned, it's not 28 teams. I think it's more like 24, 25, but still, like, that's the most of the league yeah. that's pretty much in it, right? And teams saw what the Diamondbacks did last year, right? They just got in and they were able to make a World Series run. And it was already a bit of an issue with the expanded playoffs and teams thinking, you know, if we just get it get in, we'll get the the playoff revenue, you know, from the TV deals and possibly having a game at home and or multiple games at home, all that. Now we've seen a team actually just get in and, and make it all the way to the World Series and compete for a championship. So that's made that even worse, right? That's probably the worst possible thing that could happen for this particular situation that we're talking about right now. Um, but the the deadline to me is also impacted by the draft being in the middle of July. Now it used to be in June. They've moved it to the all-star break since the pandemic. And that's 
force teams to dump a lot of time and resources into something that they have had done historically by a month at this point. And now they're all, you know, focused on the trade deadline and making trades. And, you know, we used to see a couple of like significant trades before the all-star break. Now that doesn't happen at all. Like the Luis Arise trade with the Padres and the Marlins back in April, Mm -hmm. incredibly rare. Never see that in today's game. So now that leaves teams with a couple of weeks. Also, there's no waiver deadline anymore, right? So teams can't waive guys and then trade them by the August 31st deadline, which afforded more teams to figure out, are we in it? Are we not? We even had Jerry DePoto on our show and asked him about if he would prefer to have the trade deadline pushed back because of this. And he said, yeah, you know, so like, I think August 15th would be a great time for the deadline, but for the mayor specifically <laughs> right now with this team, with how yeah. terrible the tomorrow. offense is. Yeah. You wish it was tomorrow. Right. Uh, which, you know, can be a gift and a curse, right? With, with again, with all the stuff that we just talked about, you know, our team is going to be willing to, to play ball. It takes two to tango. You can't force teams to make trades with you, right? Yeah. You have to, you have to, you, I mean, sorry, the massive, no massive series to open the, the second half uh, yeah. against the Astros who have a one game lead on. They've been hot as heck the last six weeks. Yeah. And, and, and I've, I've, told this to several people over the last couple of days that are that are that are getting on Jerry and Justin for not making a move now. You don't think the Astros are trying to add? Right. They want to add. They want to run away with this thing, overtake us and run away and add a bat or two and, and an arm. Uh yeah, no one's making deals right now. So to answer your question, I mean the Mariners have arguably the second best farm system in baseball. They have and and what separates them from some other teams that have really good farm systems is they have guys that are actually close to the majors, which last year Justin Hollander said was a problem for them in making deals was we we have a bunch of guys that are in A ball and teams don't want that, right? They want proximity to the big leagues. Yeah. And now they have that, right? They have Harry Ford, they have Cole Young, they have uh Logan Evans, they have some of these guys that are now in double A that you know, or guys that we've already seen at the major league level with the Mariners, like Tyler Locklear and Ryan Bliss. Like teams are going to have some level of interest in those players. Uh, so it really just comes down to I I truly believe they're trying to to go big game hunting and go after Luis Robert. I think there's been so much smoke around that idea for months now. We know that they've talked to them about him back when they made the Gregory Santos deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've heard that the White Sox have had had scouts both in Modesto and Tacoma uh, and probably everywhere else as well. Um, but we know those two places for sure. I think they're really trying to make that happen. My co-host Colby and I on our show, we've talked about this ad nauseum. This is the year to get kind of the Luis Castillo equivalent of bats, right? Luis Robert is the Luis Castillo equivalent of bats. Even with all the injury concern and all that, you hit on that guy, right? You pair him with Julio. Julio's going to figure it out eventually. Right. You pair him with Julio. You're going to score a lot of runs just between those two guys. Right. So I think they, they, they need to be aggressive on that front. I think they can afford to be aggressive because the misconception right now in the fan base is that if they make a big deal like that, or they make two big deals like that, they're going to wipe out the entire farm system. No, this farm system is in an amazing spot. We did a trade deadline plan on lockdown errors yesterday. Yep. I made in my mock plan, I made, Two pretty significant deals that traded top 10 prospects. I think I traded four or five top 10 prospects. And here, let me grab my phone real quick and look at my notes up and I'll tell you who this was is still- what I want the people to hear because I, I listened to that episode and, and Colby did the same thing. I think he had four of the top 10 position player prospects going for Roberts. And then you, and then you went on yeah. to list all the prospects we would still have in the system. And that's what I want people to hear in advance of this potentially happening. So I traded uh, in my mock plan. I traded Lazaro Montes. I traded Harry Ford. I traded Aiden Smith. I traded Ben Williamson, and I traded Ty Pete and Jeter Martinez. Right, those are yeah. all can, widely considered to be top fifteen guys in the Maris farm system. And even after that, I still have Cole Emerson, Cole Young, Felton Celestin, Gerangelo Sanja, Johnny Farmello, Michael Arroyo, Tyler Locklear, Logan Evans, Ryan Sloan, Brandon Garcia, Brody Hopkins. 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It's a really good farm system still. That's probably a top 10, top 15 at worst farm system in baseball, right? There's still several guys in there that are in Baseball America's top 100, Pipeline's top 100. Any prospect outlet, right, has at least a few of those guys in their top 100 list, right? So, well, and you, you can only play nine at a time, right? Yeah. If, if you have all, I still do that look, all the time. Well, and look, right? You are hoping that you are trading the Evan Whites of the world. The, and I know Jared Kelnick's having a, a better year this year, but overall, like, you're hoping that you're trading the Jared Kelnick's of the world instead yeah. of the Julios and the Logan Gilberts and, you know, if anything, this team has been really good at identifying young talent and who's worth a damn and who's not. And like, you know, you look at some of their previous trades, like the Luis Castillo trade, Nelvi Marte got popped for PEDs. Obviously, they couldn't have predicted that, but that hasn't worked out for the Reds. Edwin Arroyo hasn't worked out for them, right? A lot of these guys that they've traded, a lot of these young guys that they've traded in recent years haven't panned out for their other teams so far. Yeah. Now there's still a lot of time for that to change, but so far they've been pretty good at identifying who they're okay with trading and who they're not okay with trading. And so I, I trust them on that front. You know, there's a lot of questions about this front office and look, I'm going to get a little bit more on, on them if they don't get aggressive at this deadline. And obviously there's the topic of Jerry and, and just or Jerry and Scott not having, you know, contracts beyond this year and all that, you know, and there's going to be time for, for discussion around all that, especially if they don't do enough at the deadline. Cause there are, there are no excuses. Yes. It's going to be a tough market to maneuver. Yes. You might have to overpay technically for, for players. Do it, do it at yeah. this point, no excuses, figure it out. Cause again, you can survive it. Your, your farm system is still in a great spot even after you make significant deals. And you're also really good at drafting and developing. That's like been the one thing you've been consistently really good at is at least developing these guys into assets. Maybe not major leaguers, but assets that t other teams want, right? That can help you in trades. And I trust them. I don't, I said this on our Patreon show yesterday. I don't care about the long-term health of the Mariners organization because I, I, truly 100% believe they will figure it out. I, so. I love the perspective. I love the context. And just to, to clarify that even more uh, from your trade deadline plan show, uh, which I listened to yesterday, those all those prospects you mentioned trading away, while those names will hurt, while seeing Laz Montez being traded will hurt, it's what you brought back in total. It wasn't just Luis Robert. It was Michael Kopech, a, a power arm in the bullpen. It was Michael Conforto. It was who's having a good year and the local kid. It was Brandon Lau to play second base, who's also under club control for a couple more years. If if the, if you bring that in and it allows you to win and, and push for the World Series, then yeah. I think those fans are going to forget about those prospects pretty quickly. They just and, and by, they gotta, and by they gotta the way, get over the top. And by the way, Luis Robert still here for three more years after this yeah. season. So this whole yeah. notion that like, oh, this team in particular isn't worth investing in because the offense is so bad and Luis Robert isn't going to fix it on his own. OK, that's fine. But Luis Robert may very well move here in the next 13 days. And if the Mariners really want him and I think they do really want him, you have to get him now. It doesn't matter what the context of your season is. You have to get him now. <laughs> so yeah. and, the White Sox look, are one of those teams who are not in it. <laughs> yeah. And look, if you're if, and if you're not um if you don't believe in this team, right? I still I still I still get him for beyond this year and also if it doesn't work out, you can cool. still I can him. trade him. I yeah. can trade him. I can trade him because he's only making $12 million and he's got superstar upside. And yes, I can absolutely sell a team on that for sure. For sure. Yeah. So yeah, I, I'm not concerned about that. You know, we're not talking about, you know, if, if say like Juan Soto was still with the Padres this year, or whatever, or he was still with the nationals and they were trading him just for a couple months. Right. We're not talking about trading, you know, several high-end prospects for two months of a player, no matter how good he is. And we're not talking about that. And we're talking about club controlled potential superstar here. in Luis Robert uh, for three, for three more years after the season. Like I get so many bites at the apple with him. And then even like you mentioned with like some of the other guys that I looked at, like Michael Conforto is a rental, but I don't, I didn't really give up much of anything for, for 
Michael Conforto. And I don't think you'll have to, uh, cause it's only two months of a guy. That's a league average bat, essentially slightly above league average who probably should only hit against righties. Like that's not going to cost a ton, even in this market. But Brandon Lau has two more years of club control. He has two club options. So that might also be a long-term option at, at second base for you. So, you know, and I think those, those kinds of, uh, avenues are going to be available to the Mariners, even in this market, even with how complicated things are. But they also shouldn't be afraid to go after the rental bats because, look, you have your best, no matter how you got here, no matter how it's looked, how you got here, you still have the best opportunity to win the division in 23 years. So you should do everything you can to support that and capitalize on that. And if that means trading Michael Arroyo for two months of Christian Walker, okay. So be it. So be it. Well, let's hope they make the right moves because how much fun would it be to have this uh, Mike McDonald-led Seahawks team have an exciting, fun year? The Seahawks being in a division race while the Mariners win the AL West and make a playoff run as well. That would be a, that would be a long time. I mean, time 2022 coming. was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, it was. <laughs> Ty Dane Gonzalez, you can hear him every day if you're a baseball fan on Locked On Mariners. And uh, yeah, it was good to, to tap into your Seahawks knowledge and your Seahawks passion as well, man. I really appreciate your time. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. It was all, you know, it's always nice to talk ball in general, but it's really nice to talk some Seahawks for the first time in, in, in quite some time and not talk as much Mariners. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll check in again when the Mariners are all done and, the, and we know a little bit more about the Seahawks team in, uh, in mid season, get you back on the show again. For sure. We'd love to do it. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ty. All right. Chills. Chills. <laughs> going to take you out once again with dopamine from steven douglas and company the first single off their new ep should be coming out in the near future their second single off that record entitled gone will be out monday so you hear that on a show next week i am dan you can follow me at seahawks forever again please remember to subscribe to the channel on youtube and if you really like what i do on on the audio side you can leave a review or a rating on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify or whichever other platform you listen to. Really appreciate the support. Forever and always, go Hawks. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again in a couple of days. What's it all really mean? Knock it back, take a hit, scroll for eternity. And when I get overwhelmed, don't want to feel anything. Trip that drop and dopamine into the center of my brain. Yeah.